Hey guys, how's it going? TJ here with Dead History, and welcome to our next Vice Presidential Series installment. I'm here today with Henry. Hello. And where the heck are we? Well, yeah, look, we got a YouTube sign here at the Brick Little League in Brick, New Jersey. Yes, we're actually part of the Brick Little League. Henry plays here, plays on this field that we're on. Yup, here and in the outfield, right underneath the scoreboard, we have a great YouTube sign because we're sponsors. We're sponsors for the Brick Little League now. So it's awesome stuff. But here we go, our next Vice Presidential Series installment. Today we're looking at, what number, Henry? The 38th Vice President of the United States, Hubert Humphrey. That's right, the 38th Vice President of the United States, Hubert Humphrey. Got some cool things to tell you about Hubert Humphrey. But first, before we do that, Henry, what do the people need to do? Hit subscribe down below, leave all your comments, questions, drop a like, give a thumbs up, and like. You did it, it. you got it. it. Hit subscribe down below, give us a like and a, you know, a thumbs up, leave all those comments and questions, right? We love those. Yep. And then, of course, hit the little notification bell so you can be notified when we do release a new video. Henry, when is that? Every single week. Every single week. So here we are with our Dead History merchandise, our Dead History t-shirts, Dead History sign here at Brick Little League. Next Vice Presidential Series installment, Hubert Humphrey, the 38th Vice President of the United States. And this is Dead History. Dead History. Hey guys, how's it going? TJ back with you with Dead History here with Henry. Hello. And yep, still here at the Brick Little League in Brick, New Jersey with our YouTube sign. Brick Little League sponsors we are with our Dead History merch. And of course, here we go, our next Vice President, as Henry yawns, we're boring him apparently. <laughs> our next Vice Presidential Series installment, looking at who? The 38th Vice President, what's his name, Henry? Herbert. Nope, Hubert Humphrey. Hubert Humphrey. <laughs> it's kind of close to Herbert, right? Close. Humphrey. Hubert Humphrey, some cool things to tell you about Humphrey. We actually, you know, when I was a kid, when I was Henry's age and a little older, I remember Hubert Humphrey because the Hubert H. Humphrey Metrodome in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where the Minnesota the Twins, Twins used to play. Yeah, they used to play there. And I remember that from like the 1991 World Series against the Braves, that great World Series. I always remember the Hubert H. Humphrey Metrodome. So something I remember about him, he was the 38th vice president. And also he ran for president in 1968. Yeah, he lost pretty badly actually, but... Uh, in 1968, he ran against uh, Richard Nixon. Yeah, Richard Nixon, yes, of course. I had to think about it for a second, but yes, he lost pretty badly to Richard Nixon. So we're gonna get into all that. Also, Hubert Humphrey, born in South Dakota. Yeah, South Dakota. Yeah, a place that you uh, used to live right near. You were born right near in Montana. So I'm familiar with South Dakota. I've been there many times. So born in South Dakota. So cool things to tell you about Humphrey. We're going to get into everything. So they did the likes. They did the subscribes, comments, questions. They did it all. Notification bell. They did everything. Henry, what do they got to go get? Well, I mean, since we're here at baseball, they should go get what? Go get the Apple Jacks. Yeah, I didn't know the Cracker Jacks. The cracker jacks. Go get your Cracker Jacks, your peanuts, your popcorn, right? Let make it baseball thing. Yeah. Apple Jacks, what do you got? Cereal on your mind? <laughs> Come on back. <laughs> so here we go. Go grab your snacks. Go grab your drinks. Because here we go. Our next Vice Presidential Series installment. 38th Vice President Hubert H. Humphrey. Th this is it, right? We did everything. We did everything. Our YouTube sign, our merchandise. Here we go. Here we go. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. And enjoy. Hey guys, how's it going? TJ here with Dead History, and welcome to our next Vice Presidential Series installment as we're taking a look at the 38th Vice President of the United States, Hubert Horatio Humphrey. That's right, Hubert H. Humphrey, he is our next Vice Presidential Series installment, uh, crazy, the 38th 
Vice President of the United States. We're already up to number 38. Of course, we did skip over uh, number 36, who was Richard Nixon. And then we skipped over 37, who was Lyndon Baines Johnson. And the reason we skipped over them, of course, is because they became President of the United States. And we already covered them in our presidential series. So go check out Richard Nixon's video and Lyndon B. Johnson's video over uh, on our presidential series uh, videos. So here we go. Uh, I am flying solo uh, today for the audio. Um, just so you know, uh, Henry is feeling much, much better. He's back to school, back to baseball. Everything is right with the world. Maybe he'll be joining me for some guest appearance, appearance audio. Uh, but right now I am flying solo. So let's just jump right in. Next vice presidential series installment here at Dead History, the 38th vice president of the United States, Hubert H. Humphrey. Here we go. I did not become vice president with Lyndon Johnson to cause him trouble. Hubert H. Humphrey in 1965. As vice president during 1968, arguably the United States' most politically turbulent post-World War II year, Hubert Humphrey faced an excruciating test of statesmanship. During a time of war in Southeast Asia, when the stakes for this nation were great, Humphrey confronted an agonizing choice, whether to remain loyal to his president or to the dictates of his conscience. His failure to reconcile these powerful claims cost him the presidency, yet few men placed in his position could have walked so agonizing a tightrope over so polarized a nation. Near the end of his long career, an Associated Press poll of 1,000 congressional administrative assistants cited Hubert Humphrey as the most effective senator of the preceding 50 years. A biographer pronounced him the premier lawmaker of his generation, widely recognized during his career as the leading progressive in American public life the Minnesota senator was often ahead of public opinion, which eventually caught up with him. When it did, he was able to become one of Congress's most constructive legislators and a trailblazer for civil rights and social justice. His story is one of rich accomplishment and shattering frustration. Hubert Humphrey's oratorical talents, foremost among his abundant personal and political qualities, powered his rapid ascent to national prominence. Lyndon Johnson remarked that Hubert has the greatest coordination of mind and tongue of anybody I know. Although Harry Truman was one among many who recognized that this Rembrandt with words frequently talked too much, dubbed Minnesota Chats by Johnny Carson, Humphrey often let himself, I'm sorry, Humphrey often left himself open to the charge that he was a Gabby extremist of the left, a label that stuck with him despite his moves towards moderation. Any lapses of caution may have been the result of Humphrey the orator being an incandescent improviser, with overstatement being the price he paid for his dazzling eloquence. Humphrey drew his oratorical power from his emotional temperament, which sometimes left him in tears on the stump undoubtedly moving many in his audience. He would say that he had 
a zealous righteousness burning within him. Yet his ultimate legislative accomplishments were achieved when he moderated the firebrand and willingly compromised with his opponents. In fact, Humphrey learned to combine his rhetorical talents effectively with his substantive goals by developing into a persuader and for the most part foregoing intimidation, unlike his colleague and mentor, Lyndon Johnson. It is not surprising that, while Johnson hated the powerlessness of the vice presidency, Humphrey relished the national podium it offered. A Prairie Progressive The origins of the Minnesotan's zealous righteousness can be found in his home state's tradition of agrarian reformism that tenaciously promoted the disinherited underdogs at the expense of the interests. Humphrey personally was a warm, sincere, even corny populist, an old-time prairie progressive politically descended from the likes of William Jennings Bryan, George Norris, and Robert La Follette Sr., Born in South Dakota in 1911, Humphrey learned his ideology firsthand in the persistent agricultural depression of the Midwest during the 1920s and 1930s. He and his family were victims, like so many others, of the Dust Bowl and the Great Depression that had evicted them from their home and business. Humphrey's poor rural upbringing stirred both him and his pharmacist father to become politically conscious, ardent New Dealers. Thus, Humphrey was permanently marked by the Depression, which in turn stimulated him to study and teach college political science in the employ of the New Deal's Work Progress Administration. After Humphrey became an administrator in that agency, the Minnesota Democratic Party recognized his oratorical talents and in their search for new blood, tapped him as candidate for mayor of Minneapolis. Although he lost his first race in 1943, he succeeded in 1945. This post would prove to be Humphrey's sole executive experience until the time of his vice presidency. He made the most of it, successfully impressing his reformist principles on organized crime by stretching his mayoral powers to their limit on the strength of his personality and his ability to control the city's various factions. Hubert Humphrey's mayoral mayoral success and visibility propelled him directly into the Senate for a career that would encompass five terms. He was first elected in 1948 after gaining national attention at the Democratic National Convention with his historic plea for civil rights legislation. Although no strong constituency existed for this issue in Minnesota, The position was in line with Humphrey's championing of others among his state's underdogs, including farmers, labor, and small business. In hammering his civil rights plank into the platform, Humphrey helped to bring the breakaway progressive supporters of Henry Wallace back into the Democratic fold, while simultaneously prompting the Dixiecrats to walk out of the convention, hall, and the party. For observers of U.S. politics from the late 1940s into the 1970s, the name Hubert Humphrey likely triggers a torrent of memories. Among such images may be his 1948 speech pleading with the Democratic Party 
to get out of the shadow of states' rights and walk forthrightly into the bright sunshine of human rights. The ebullient, happy warrior on the presidential campaign trail, his, his incongruous reference to the politics of joy in the midst of televised coverage of violent demonstrations during the 1968 Democratic Convention, or a haggard U.S. Senator advising a president while himself dying of cancer. Humphrey's vice presidency was scarcely the high point of a long and distinguished career of public service. As vice president, Humphrey struggled to balance loyalty to a domineering and often ungrateful Lyndon Johnson, his own sense of responsibility to the nation, and his searing ambition to be president himself. Despite sporadic involvement in foreign policy and more regular participation in domestic policy and politics, Humphrey's talents and energies were largely checked and his weaknesses magnified by a suspicious president and a polarizing polity. Little wonder, then, that Hubert Humphrey compared being vice president to being naked in the middle of a blizzard with no one to even offer you a match to keep you warm. Humphrey was a quintessentially public man. Not only did he spend most of his adult life in elective office, but he also was deeply committed to preserving and enhancing democratic governance. Throughout, too, Humphrey evidently craved recognition and affection and strove untiringly, if futilely, to become president. Hubert Horatio Humphrey Jr., though a second son, was named after his father, the Junior Humphrey, also had an elder and a younger sister. Humphrey was born in Wallace, South Dakota, but he spent most of his childhood in nearby Doland, where the family moved when he was four. In both Humphrey's telling and that of others, the roots of his love of politics and of many of his policy commitments can be traced to these early years. Humphrey's father, a pharmacist and small drugstore owner, was an especially important influence. The young boy's rhetorical skills and political values were nurtured by a father who regularly read his children Woodrow Wilson's 14 points and William Jennings Bryan's cross of gold speech and who conducted ongoing political debates at the drugstore Soda Fountain. Although the senior Humphrey was one of only a handful of Democrats in South Dakota, he was well respected, later serving as mayor and state legislator. Like most members of his generation, Humphrey was deeply affected by the Great Depression. Economic troubles began early in South Dakota as its agricultural economy faltered and banks closed even before the devastating dust storms began. Humphrey's parents lost their house in 1927 and eventually moved to Huron, South Dakota, where his father opened another pharmacy in 1931. Hubert Humphrey Jr., recalled being impressed by his parents' capacity to survive such setbacks without becoming bitter. Although he watched as his father extended credit and accepted barter for goods, he also became a staunch supporter of Franklin D. Roosevelt and the New Deal. The Depression also interfered with the young Humphrey's college plans. Initially, he and his older brother Ralph attended the University of Minnesota during alternate years. However, both returned home in March of 1931 to help their father with the new drugstore. The following winter, Hubert completed a six-month course at Capitol College of Pharmacy in Denver, apparently resigned to life as a small-town pharmacist. Humphrey married Muriel Buck in September of 1936, but he remembered 
the depression, the dust storms, and the demands of family on a newlywed couple were finally too much. Using Muriel Buck Humphrey savings, the two moved back to Minneapolis in September of 1937, where Hubert resumed college. Muriel, who did not return to school, worked as a bookkeeper. In Minneapolis, the trademark Humphrey energy and speaking talents quickly surfaced. Humphrey completed his degree in political science in June of 1939, graduating magna cum laude. He also was elected to Phi Beta Kappa and won a Big Ten debating championship. Humphrey's next stop was Louisiana State University, which awarded him a graduate fellowship to study political science. At least by his own account, the year Humphrey spent at LSU taught him painful lessons about the discrimination blacks suffered in the United States and exposed him to Southern politics, an experience he would draw on later in the Senate. After finishing a master's degree with a thesis on the political philosophy of the New Deal, Humphrey returned to the University of Minnesota to begin doctoral work. Needing more money than a teaching assistantship provided to support a growing family, his first child was born in 1939 with three others to follow. However, he started working in summer of 1940 in a series of Works Progress Administration, WPA, positions. Humphrey trained adult education teachers in Duluth, directed the Workers' Education Program for the Twin Cities, and served as State Director of Workers' Services. By 1942, Humphrey was charged with liquidating WPA programs in the state, and in 1943, he was named Assistant Director of the Minnesota War Manpower Commission. Despite persistent efforts to join the armed services, though, Humphrey initially failed physicals and then received deferments as a critical domestic worker. Humphrey's childhood fascination with politics persisted. Meanwhile, his university connections put him in contact with several political activists and his WPA positions had introduced him to local labor leaders. It did not take much encouragement to convince Humphrey to challenge the incumbent mayor of Minneapolis in 1943. Although he ultimately lost to the sitting mayor, Humphrey was able to reach a runoff, drawing support from the local AFL and the Jewish and black communities. Although Humphrey next accepted a teaching job at McAllister College in St. Paul, he later readily admitted teaching was a pale second choice. I was permanently hooked on politics. Meanwhile, the future vice president plunged into numerous political activities. Working with local labor groups had catalyzed his opposition to the communist left that had inf infiltrated Minnesota unions. Humphrey worked with Philip Murray, the president of the national CIO, to rid the Minnesota chapter of communists. More important for later national political endeavors, Humphrey also became one of the founders of Americans for Democratic Action, which sought to articulate an ideology that was both strongly anti-communist and liberal. In addition, concerned about the inability of liberal candidates to win statewide elections, Humphrey enlisted the help of the National Democratic Party, itself worried about the narrow Roosevelt victory in Minnesota in 1940, to achieve the fusion of the Minnesota Democratic Party with the former Labor Party. With the merger accomplished in 1944, Humphrey ran FDR's campaign in the state and attended his first national convention as a delegate. Humphrey succeeded at moving into politics full-time when he was elected mayor of Minneapolis in 1945. 
The new mayor quickly, I'm sorry, the new mayor moved quickly to clean up the city. Notorious for its police corruption, gambling, and prostitution. He also worked to reduce racism and anti-Semitism among police officers and is credited with creating the nation's first Municipal Fair Employment Practices Commission. Although Humphrey was easily re-elected in 1947, the sirens of national politics beckoned. As he later wrote, the Cold War and international events seemed more compelling than veterans' housing and liquor licenses. In 1948, the mayor exploded into national consciousness, igniting a firestorm of controversy. At the Democratic Convention, he spoke advocating passage of a strong civil rights plank to the party's platform, an action that most in the party hierarchy opposed and a majority of the platform committee refused to take. To the surprise of many, including Humphrey himself, the plank was approved, triggering Strom Thurmond and 35 other Southern delegates to walk out. Although mobilization by key big city bosses, led by Ed Flynn from the Bronx, mostly accounted for the plank's success. Humphrey's speech is likely the most remembered and most effective speech he ever delivered. Surprising to critics of Humphrey's long-windedness may be that the speech was a mere 10 minutes long. Mr. Chairman, fellow Democrats, fellow Americans, I realize that in speaking in behalf of the Minority Report on Civil Rights, as presented by Congressman D. Miller of Wisconsin, that I'm dealing with a charged issue, with an issue which has been confused by emotionalism on all sides of the fence. I realize that there are here today friends and colleagues of mine, many of them, who feel just as deeply and keenly as I do about this issue and who are yet in complete disagreement with me. My respect and admiration for these men and their views was great when I came to this convention. It is now far greater because of the sincerity, the courtesy, and the forthrightness with which many of them have argued in our prolonged discussions in the platform committee. Because of this very great respect and because of my profound belief that we have a challenging task to do here, because good conscience, decent morality demands it, I feel I must rise at this time to support a report, the Minority Report, a report that spells out our democracy, a report that the people of this country can and will understand, and a report that they will enthusiastically acclaim on the great issue of civil rights. Now let me say this at the outset, that this proposal is made for no single region. Our proposal is made for no single class, for no single racial or religious group in mind. All of the regions of this country, all of the states, have shared in our precious heritage of American freedom. All the states and all the regions have seen at least some of the infringements of that freedom. All people, Get this, all people, white and black, all groups, all racial groups, have been the victims at time in this nation of, let me say, vicious discrimination. The masterly statement of our keynote speaker, the distinguished United States Senator from Kentucky, Alvin Barkley, made that point with great force. Speaking of the founder of our party, Thomas Jefferson, he said this, and I quote, from Alvin Barkley, he did not proclaim that all the white or the black or the red or the yellow men are equal, that all Christian or Jewish men are equal, that all Protestant and Catholic men are equal, that all rich and poor men are equal, that all good and bad men are equal. What he declared 
was that all men are equal. And the equality which he proclaimed was the equality in the right to enjoy the blessings of free government in which they may participate and to which they have given their support. Now these words of Senator Barclays are appropriate to this convention, appropriate to this convention of the oldest, the most truly progressive political party in America. From the time of Thomas Jefferson, the time when that immortal American doctrine of individual rights under just and fairly administered laws, the Democratic Party has tried hard to secure expanding freedom for all citizens. Oh yes, I know, other political parties may have talked more about civil rights, but the Democratic Party has surely done more about civil rights. We have made progress, we've made great progress. In every part of this country, we've made great progress in the South, we've made it in the West, in the North, and in the East. But we must now focus the direction of that progress towards the, towards the realization of a full program of civil rights to all. This convention must set out more specifically the directions in which our party efforts are to go. We can be proud that we can be guided by the courageous trailblazing of two great democratic presidents. We can be proud of the fact that our great and beloved immortal leader Franklin Roosevelt gave us guidance. And we can be proud of the fact we can be proud of the fact that Harry Truman has had the courage to give to the people of America the new Emancipation Proclamation. It seems to me, it seems to me that the Democratic Party needs to make definite pledges of the kind suggested in the Minority Report to maintain the trust and the confidence placed in it by the people of all races and all sections of this country. Sure, we're here as Democrats, but my good friends, we're here as Americans. We're here as the believers in the principle and the ideology of democracy. And I firmly believe that as men concerned with our country's future, we must specify in our platform the guarantees which we have mentioned in the Minority Report. Yes, this is far more than a party matter. Every citizen in this country has a stake in the emergence of the United States as a leader in a free world. That world is being challenged by the world of slavery. For us to play our part effectively, we must be in a morally sound position. We can't use a double standard. There's no room for double standards in American politics, for measuring our own and other people's policies. Our demands for democratic practices in other lands will be no more effective than the guarantee of those practices in our own country. Friends, delegates, I do not believe that there can be any compromise on the guarantees of the civil rights which we have mentioned in the Minority Report. In spite, in spite of my desire for unanimous agreement on the entire platform, in spite of my desire to see everybody here in honest and unanimous agreement, there are some matters which I think must be stated clearly and without qualification. There can be no hedging. The newspaper headlines are wrong. There will be no hedging, and there will be no watering down, if you please, of the instruments and the principles of the civil rights program. <laughs> to those who say, my friends, to those who say that we are rushing this issue of civil rights, I say to them, we are 172 years late. To those who say, to those who say that this civil rights program is an infringement on states' rights, I say this, the time has arrived in America for the Democratic Party to get out of the shadows of states' rights and to walk forthrightly into the bright sunshine of human rights. People, people, human beings, this is the issue of the 20th century. 
people of all kinds, all sorts of people. And these people are looking to America for leadership, and they're looking to America for precept and example. My good friends, my fellow Democrats, I ask you for a calm consideration of our historic opportunity. Let us not forget the evil, pa let us do forget the evil passions and the blindness of the past. In these times of world, economic, political, and spiritual, above all spiritual crisis, we cannot and we must not turn from the path so plainly before us. That path has already led us through many valleys of the shadow of death, and now is the time to recall those who were left on that path of American freedom. For all of us here, for the millions who have sent us, for the whole two billion members of the human family, our land is now more than ever before the last best hope on earth. And I know that we can, and I know that we shall, began here the fuller and richer realization of that hope, that promise of a land where all men are truly free and equal, and each man uses his freedom and equality wisely well. My good friends, I ask my party, I ask the Democratic Party to march down the high road of progressive democracy. I ask this convention, I ask this convention to say in unmistakable terms that we proudly hail and we courageously support our president and leader, Harry Truman, in his great fight for civil rights in America. In the Senate, Humphrey's headline-grabbing civil rights speech appealed to Minneapolis's liberal community and his stand in favor of the Marshall Plan and against the Taft-Hartley Labor Management Relations Law attracted the support of farmers and labor. As a result, Minnesota elected a Democrat to the Senate for the first time since 1901. In his first feisty days in the Senate, Humphrey immediately moved to the cutting edge of liberalism by introducing dozens of bills in support of programs to increase aid to schools, expand the Labor Department, rescind corporate tax loopholes, and establish a health insurance program that was eventually enacted a decade and a half later as Medicare. In addition, Humphrey spoke as a freshman senator on hundreds of topics with the order of a moralizing reformer. Accustomed to discussing candidly and openly policy matters that disturbed him, the junior senator quickly ran afoul of the Senate's conservative establishment. He found that many senators snubbed him for his support of the Democratic Party's 1948 civil rights plank. And as Senator Robert C. Byrd has written, Humphrey chose his first battles poorly, once rising to demand the abolition of the Joint Committee on the Reduction of Non-Essential Federal Expenditures as a Non-Essential Expenditure. Committee Chairman Harry Byrd Sr. happened to be away from the Senate floor at the time. But he and the other powerful senior senators punished this, punished this breach of decorum by further isolating Humphrey. Yet Humphrey, under the guidance of Democratic leader Lyndon Johnson, soon moderated his ways, if not his goals. As New York Times congressional correspondent William S. White observed in his classic study of the early 1950s, Senate, Humphrey's slow ascent to grace was due to the clear but far from simple fact that he had in him so many latently senatorial qualities. Not long had he been around before it became evident that, notwithstanding his regrettable past, he had a tactile sense of the moods and the habits and the mind of the place. By the mid-1950s, Humphrey had moved into the ranks of the Senate's inner club. 
It is hardly surprising that a politician so filled with energy and vision and vision had presidential ambitions dating from the time of his mayor, mayoral election. Indeed, on six occasions during his career, Humphrey sought either the presidency or the vice presidency. His first foray into the vice presidential race was 1952, but it was the 1956 contest that revealed the essential Humphrey as he campaigned vigorously for that office after presidential nominee Adlai Stevenson threw open the nomination. Undaunted by his failure in that contest, Humphrey continued his advocacy role in the Senate. Then, in 1958, during a visit to the Soviet Union as part of a fact-finding trip to Europe, Humphrey engaged in a historic eight-and-a-half-hour impromptu conversation on disarmament with Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev. This event thrust him into the international spotlight, and the publicity he gained made him an instant presidential candidate for 1960. Yet Humphrey, a longtime proponent of disarmament, then paradoxically exploited this pub publicity to criticize President Dwight Eisenhower for allowing a missile gap to develop. In 1960, a defense issue of a more personal stripe helped to undermine Humphrey's presidential bid. More than in any other of his many election years, his World War II draft deferment, first as a father and then for a medical condition identified as a right scrotal hernia, was used against him in the primaries. Although Humphrey's draft status seemed to invite exploitation by his political opponents, his chronic lack of campaign funds and organization, as well as his moderate liberal image, actually lost him the nomination. Well, well, well. I just uh, just ran into a special guest here. Mr. Henry, hello. Hello. How are you? I am good. What's going on? Anything? No, no, really. <laughs> no? No. We're sitting here talking about our 38th vice president. You remember his name? Hubert. Hubert Humphrey. Humphrey. There you go. Hubert Humphrey. That's right. Mm -hmm. Do you know who he was vice president under? Any idea? Richard Nixon. Uh, you're close. No, though. But you're very close. Uh, no, 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 no. So before Nixon, mm -hmm. how about this? The guy who was vice president under Kennedy, and he took over as president when Kennedy was assassinated. Remember that is? The 36th president. President. Le Lyndon yeah. Johnson? Lyndon Johnson. You got it. Good job, dude. Just spit it right out. You know what I mean? Johnson. There you go. You got it. So nothing else new? Really? Spring break from school right now? Mm -hmm. You enjoying it? Yeah. Good. Playing baseball, right? Yeah. Love baseball? Yes. Good job. All right, well, thanks for stopping in and saying hi. You're welcome. I'm sure we'll uh, catch up with you again later. Mm -hmm. All right, see you, Henry. Bye. All right, back to it here now. Out of defeat, the irrepressible Minnesotian snatched senatorial victory by becoming the choice of departing Majority Leader and Vice President-elect Lyndon Johnson for Senate Majority Whip. Humphrey used his new post to become a driving force in the Senate. Johnson had promoted Humphrey for this leadership position as a re reward for his cooperation in the Senate and a solidifier relationship for the benefit of the Kennedy administration. Newly elected Majority Leader Mike Mansfield noted Humphrey's vibrant personality and phenomenal energy. These traits, coupled with a newfound pragmatism, pragmatism, I'm sorry, gained him appointment to the Appropriations Committee and a solid record of legislative accomplishment. Humphrey went on to become a major congressional supporter of a number of new frontier programs, many of which had been originally outlined in his own bills in the 1950s. Chief among these were the Job Corps 
the Peace Corps, an extension of the Food for Peace program, and a score of progressive measures pertaining to health, education, and welfare. Humphrey's role in pressing for the landmark 1963 limited nuclear test ban treaty with the Soviet Union ranks as one of his greatest triumphs. A supporter of disarmament since the 1950s, he helped persuade President Eisenhower to follow the Soviets into a voluntary testing moratorium. Humphrey was a follower of George Kennan's, or maybe Kennan's, George Kennan or Kennan's, geostrategic analysis, which counseled a moderate course designed selectively and non-provocatively to contain Soviet probes into areas vital to the United States. This middle way between provocation and disarmament also encouraged, encouraged pragmatic negotiations, and Humphrey continued to prod President John F. Kennedy into the more permanent test ban treaty and the establishment of a U.S. arms control and disarmament agency. At the treaty signing ceremony, President Kennedy recognized Humphrey's years of often lonely efforts, commenting, Hubert, this is your treaty, and it had better work. The principal items on Humphrey's long-standing domestic legislative agenda failed to advance significantly until the so-called Great Society period that followed Kennedy's death. The first and perhaps biggest breakthrough came with the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which he managed in a Senate obstructed by Southern filibusters. In working for that legislation, Humphrey skillfully combined his talents as a soft-spoken, behind-the-scenes negotiator with a rhetorical hard sell focused on the media. Humphrey's subsequent record of legislative achievement was remarkable. With his support, federal aid to farmers and rural areas increased, as did the new food stamp program and foreign aid food exports that benefited the farms. Congress authorized scholarships, scientific research grants, aid to schools, rehabilitation of dropouts, and vocational guidance. Legislation promoted public power po projects, mass transportation, public housing, and greater unemployment benefits. While the Minnesota senator could claim credit for helping to create millions of jobs, he also reaped the scorn of critics fearful of deficit spending. Humphrey replied that a balanced budget is a futile dream, which could not be attained anyway until the world is in balance. Dismissing those Scrooges who harbored a bookkeeper's mentality, Humphrey, a self-proclaimed Jolly Santa, reiterated his priority, people's needs and desires. The year 1948 also marked Humphrey's first election to the U.S. Senate, where he would serve until 1964 and again from 1970 to 1978. He was the first Democrat to be elected to the Senate from Minnesota since it became a state in 1858. At the outset, Humphrey faced considerable opposition and mistrust he recounted, My actions at the Democratic Convention had elicited bitterness and antagonism far beyond what I expected. I was treated like an evil force that had seeped into sanctified halls. The new senator made matters worse by violating hoary institutional norms. For example, he was silent for a mere six weeks. Then, the urge to speak that would be that would generate criticism throughout his career took over. His cocky attitude caused 
a Republican senator to whisper to a colleague during a Humphrey speech that the brash Minnesotan reminded him of some tomatoes he once planted too early in the spring and the frost got them. Humphrey's biggest mistake during this early period was giving a floor speech that criticized the Joint Committee on Reduction of Non-Essential Federal Expenditures, chaired by the powerful Harry Byrd from Virginia. Worse yet, the novice senator attacked the committee when Byrd was away attending to his ill mother. Despite Humphrey's apology the next day, Byrd delivered a scathing lecture on the floor of the Senate on the institution's norms. More than 25 senators followed to deliver their own attacks. As humiliating as this well-reported experience was to Humphrey, it showed his resilience and willingness to learn from his mistakes. Earning the respect of his colleagues took time and hard work, features that would mark the rest of Humphrey's tenure. In the Senate, Humphrey's breakthrough came when he and Paul Douglas from Illinois offered a series of amendments to 1950 tax legislation. Although virtually all of the proposed changes lost, the two senators were well prepared. The acknowledged experts on the Finance Committee congratulated the pair on the constructive and responsible nature of a week-long debate. After this rocky start, Humphrey embarked on an extraordinarily productive Senate career. In his first two terms, the Minnesota Senator sponsored 1,044 bills and joint resolutions. Moreover, among these proposals were several path-breaking initiatives. Humphrey, for example, was one of the architects of PL 480, which evolved into Food for Peace, authored the 1958 National Defense Education Act, and was instrumental in the creation of the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency and the ratification of the 1963 Limited Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. Not all of Humphrey's proposals, of course, immediately became law. For example, the first bill Humphrey introduced in 1949 was to establish a program providing health care to the elderly through the Social Security system, a direct ancestor of Medicare, enacted in 1965. Meanwhile, throughout his Senate service, Humphrey took special interest in legislation in the areas of civil rights, public education, labor, and the Peace Corps. Long interested in foreign affairs and acutely aware that presidential candidates are expected to have some foreign policy credentials, Humphrey pushed for the creation of a Senate subcommittee on nuclear disarmament in 1955, which he chaired and also served for a time as the congressional delegate to the United Nations. Once John F. Kennedy was elected president, Humphrey was chosen by the Senate Democrats as majority whip under Mike Mansfield, a position that made him the chief enforcer of party loyalty in the Senate. Far more energetic and adept at legislative maneuvering than the majority leader, Humphrey was an effective advocate for JFK's legislative program. After Kennedy's assassination, Humphrey joined Johnson in pushing hard to get the remaining Kennedy agenda through Congress. Most observers, including the new president, credit Humphrey with being instrumental in securing Senate passage of major legislation like the 1964 Omnibus Tax Bill and the Civil Rights Act of 1964. At the same time, Humphrey could not boast an unblemished record of accomplishment in the Senate. For example, perhaps reflecting Humphrey's own strong 
anti-communism, he did not distinguish himself by opposing Senator Joseph McCarthy, even though he was a member of McCarthy's Government Operations Committee. Indeed, some of Humphrey's language was written into the Communist Control Act of 1954, which sought to outlaw the Communist Party altogether. More generally, at least one former legislative assistant has questioned the depth and quality of the Minnesota Senator's deliberativeness. Humphrey was a whirling dervish who absorbed things fantastically quick. But the idea of Humphrey reading a book or sitting down long enough to seriously think about the implications of what he was doing is hard to imagine. He was so active that I don't think he had time to think about the big things. The U.S. Senate, of course, also was where Humphrey and Lyndon Johnson developed the difficult and complex relationship that would be so bedevil the former's vice presidency. Each man always claimed to have deep, genuine affection for the other. Moreover, their relationship produced mutual benefits. For example, Humphrey credited LBJ, along with his LSU debate partner Russell Long, with establishing his credibility among Southern Senators. For his part, Johnson saw Humphrey as his link with the liberal intellectual wing of the Democratic Party, which had long suspected the Texan. After JFK was assassinated, Humphrey worked to convince many Kennedy advisors to stay on in the White House and contributed the memorable phrase, let us continue, to LBJ's first speech as president. One also can interpret LBJ's actions in a less benign light. According to historian Paul Conkin, Johnson used and wooed Humphrey when they were senators, making the latter a bit of a protege. He befriended him and to some extent bought his loyalty. As minority leader, for instance, LBJ got Humphrey on the coveted Foreign Relations Committee in January of 1953. Thus, Lyndon recognized his worth, flattered his ego, and inhibited Humphrey from agitating domestic issues that divided Senate Democrats. Because the Minnesota Senator had to give up assignments on the Agriculture and the Labor and Public Welfare Committees. More fundamentally, Konkin argues, LBJ had considerable disdain for men like Humphrey. Behind his exuberance and talkativeness, Humphrey was an intellectual with a few scholarly credentials. This side of him and his identification with the Senate's northern liberals created elements of jealousy and resentment on Johnson's part. Despite his clear love of the Senate, Humphrey, like many of his colleagues there, nursed presidential ambitions. For this, he offered few apologies. I thought lack of ambition was sinful and that a politician without it was ready for retirement. In 1956, Humphrey became one of the first candidates ever to campaign openly for the Democratic vice presidential nomination. He believed that Adlai Stevenson had promised to name him as his running mate, and Humphrey was stunned when Stevenson opened the nomination to convention vote. Utterly unprepared, Humphrey ran fifth on the first ballot and then shifted his support to Senate colleague Estes Kavarver, who won the nomination on the second ballot. Again, Humphrey rebounded from a humiliating experience and shifted his attention to the presidency, becoming the first formal candidate in 1960. He entered only two primaries, Wisconsin and West Virginia, and was decisively defeated by John Kennedy in both. The Humphrey camp attributed Kennedy's 
Wisconsin victory to a heavy Catholic crossover vote. But the Minnesota Senator's disastrous loss in West Virginia produced more lasting scars. In West Virginia, he was hamstrung by the issue of Kennedy's Catholicism, which had surfaced in Wisconsin. Humphrey could scarcely discuss it without appearing to be a religious bigot. At least as important, the Kennedy campaign had insurmountable funding and organizational advantages. Humphrey was most bitter, however, about Franklin Delano Roosevelt Jr.'s attack on his World War II service record, which Humphrey believed Robert Kennedy instigated, though whether this was the case is considerably less clear. Humphrey withdrew after garnering only 39.2% of the vote in West Virginia to JFK's 60.8%. The West Virginia contest produced lasting coolness between Humphrey and the Kennedys and apparently led the Minnesota senator to reject out of hand tentative offers from the Kennedy camp to become the vice presidential nominee. Ever the good soldier though, Humphrey did help quell a liberal revolt against LBJ at the 1960 Democratic Convention. The following political debate between Senator John F. Kennedy and Senator Hubert H. Humphrey is being presented by WCHS-TV, the Charleston Gazette, and the participating stations as a public service. Now, here is the moderator for the debate, WCHS-TV News Director, Bill Ames. Good evening. The West Virginia primary election campaign has already been characterized by the unique and the unusual, and that tradition is being followed in spectacular and unusual fashion tonight with a face-to-face -face debate between Senator Hubert H. Humphrey of Minnesota and Senator John F. Kennedy of Massachusetts. For weeks, the attention of the nation has been focused on the voters of West Virginia and on the efforts of these two men to enlist their support in the presidential preference balloting next Tuesday. In that voting, only registered Democrats can cast their ballots for these presidential candidates, and the outcome of the voting is not binding on the Democratic delegates to the July convention in Los Angeles. Still, it is generally agreed that the results of next week's election in West Virginia will be important to the presidential ambitions of the winner and of the loser. With a desire to crystallize for the voter the issues in the West Virginia presidential race, the Charleston Gazette, WCHS-TV, and participating stations in and out of the state have brought Senators Humphrey and Kennedy together for this encounter. Formal debate will begin the program. A question and answer period will follow the debate. The questions which will be asked have been sent in to the Charleston Gazette by its readers. The questions will be put to the senators by the two men on either side of me, Ned Chilton, assistant to the publisher of the Charleston Gazette, and by Dale Schussler of the news department of WTRF-TV in Wheeling. Gentlemen, in the debate, you will each have an opportunity for an opening five-minute statement. Then you will have five minutes for rebuttal, in the toss of a coin before broadcast time tonight, you won Senator Kennedy and then chose to go second in debate. The order to be followed in opening statements and rebuttal, therefore, is the opening, Senator Humphrey, then an opening by Senator Kennedy, rebuttal by Senator Humphrey, and rebuttal by Senator Kennedy. Now, the sound of this buzzer will indicate that your time is at an end, and I ask your cooperation in observing the limitations placed upon you. And so, Senator Humphrey, may we begin with your opening five-minute statement. Thank you, Mr. Ames and fellow Americans. Now, every political campaign should make a truly constructive contribution to American democracy. We should learn and become informed. And I have learned that here in West Virginia that you want a government which never rests in this all-important and vital effort to build a secure and an enduring peace. I have learned that you want a government that cares and acts for the people 
and understands the needs of the people. And you want a government that isn't blinded by budget balancing slogans, but rather is deeply dedicated to a balanced nation in which the pockets of depression and unemployment and poverty are erased. Now the problems of this wonderful and beautiful West Virginia are much the same as those of other states and indeed of the world itself. And mind you, these problems are growing and spreading like a cancer throughout our very land. There's one thing to me that's crystal clear. America needs a democratic victory. And I pledge my wholehearted and active support to any forward-looking Democrat who may win the nomination. And I mean that to my friend John Kennedy as well. Richard Nixon must not be the next president of the United States. We've had too many years of caretaker government that ignores problems and avoids opportunities. Too many years of shameful neglect of America's needs at home and waste and loss of America's prestige abroad. We have, in fact, friends, been the victims of a no-go, go-slow, not-now veto administration. Popularity has been substituted for leadership and mediocrity for principle. Slogans have been offered in place of programs and public relations instead of genuine public service. America, yes, West Virginia, deserves a much better deal. Now we have one basic problem. A conservative Republican government in Washington that is content with standing still in a changing America and a very rapidly changing world and talk. Talk has been substituted for deeds. Little or nothing has been done about distressed industries such as coal or depressed areas or the problems of technological unemployment and automation. Or indeed, little or nothing about the growing demands and needs of education or the care of our elderly. The Republican administration has put on the brakes on the American economy when we should be moving ahead with giant strides. It has complained about growing surpluses of food and fiber, while in many parts of America, yes, in West Virginia, children suffer from inadequate diet. It shouts of inflation as it adds to the cost of living by hiking up the interest rates and tightening up the credit. And we pay a terrible price for this indifference. Now, these problems in West Virginia and the other states of our union are in fact, however, not the worst that America faces. Time has caught up with America. For the past seven years, the Soviet Union has been eating up the lead that America inherited, indeed, from past administrations. And it's going to be a pitiful inheritance that our next president will receive from this administration when he sits across the table from the Soviet dictator, Mr. Khrushchev. Now, the next 10 years may well decide whether the United States is to be a first-class power or become a second-class nation. More than a year ago, I sat across the table from Mr. Khrushchev for better than eight hours. I saw him as he is, tough and able, a communist, a Bolshevik, determined to surpass the United States. And he is determined that communism will rule the world. And I am determined that it will not. Now, the next president must arouse this nation to heroic deeds. He must courageously search for a lasting peace with justice and freedom. And he must understand the complexities of disarmament negotiations, the workings of diplomacy, the United Nations. He must develop a force for peace, using our food and our fiber surplus to feed the hungry, our medical knowledge to heal the sick, and our education to teach the illiterate. I've tried to prepare myself for this. Now, the West Virginia primary is more than a popularity contest. There are differences between the candidates. But the basic difference has been very accurately assessed by the journalists of one of temperament and one of attitude and one of approach. Now, how you should vote, I think, depends on your sober assessment of the need of West Virginia. Satisfied with things as they are, then you will vote for Mr. Nixon. If you think that only a little change, a moderate change is needed for my friend. If you believe that a vigorous, hard-hitting, constructive action is required, you know my record and I hope you'll find me your man. Thank you. And now, Senator Kennedy, it's your turn for five minutes of an opening statement. Ladies and gentlemen, I run for the presidency after 18 years in the service of the United States. 
four years in the Navy and 14 years in the Congress because I believe the presidency is the key office. It is the center of action. And because I believe strongly in my country and in its destiny, and because I believe the power and influence of the next president and his vitality and force are going to be the great factor in meeting the responsibilities that we're going to face. So I run for the presidency. And because the presidency is the people's office, as no other office is, it is my judgment that any candidate for the presidency should be willing to submit their name, their fortunes, their record and their views to people in primaries all over the United States. West Virginia has such a primary, and that is the reason that I am here. I did not have to come. I came of my own free will. There are no delegates involved. A setback here, a defeat, would be a major one. But nevertheless, I came, and I must say I am extremely glad I came. I think this is the best experience and the best education that an American political leader can have, whether he serves in the presidency or serves in the Senate. Many of you who may be watching television in other parts of the country have been seeing a good deal of West Virginia through your TV. And I wonder whether you realize what a varied state it is and how unusual is its past and how bright is its promise. If there is one quality which I think this state can be justly proud of, it is the quality of courage. More men from West Virginia lost their lives in the Korean War than from any state in the Union of its size. More West Virginians served in World War II than for any state of its size. I was in Hinton this morning, which is the home of the navigator who flew with my brother before he was killed. This is a state which has sent men to die in every section of the world. And also here in the state of West Virginia, you have to have courage to work in the basic industry of this state, coal mining. Eight West Virginians die in the coal mines of this state every month. These people are tough and hard. They've lived in the mountains. They're probably more descendants of American Revolutionary soldiers here in West Virginia than in any state of the country. George Washington said many years ago, let me plant a banner in those mountains and I will set men free. This is a state that deserves an opportunity. It deserves recognition from our federal government. Last night I was in McDowell County. That county produces more coal than any county in the world. There are more people on relief in that county than in any county in the country. Now why should there be 250,000 people living on a subsistence and below subsistence distribution from the federal government who only want to work, 100,000 able-bodied men who want a job and can't find it, who have spent their lives in the coal mines, who have spent their lives underground working in 35 or 40 inches, and who want to get a job again, who want to work. That is the problem of West Virginia. This state can really do a good deal. I don't think I've seen a more vigorous industrial complex than I've seen along the Ohio Valley and the Kanawha River, or better farms. The people of this state only need a chance, and I think that they're going to get it. I think this election is probably as important to West Virginia as any state in the country. And I hope the people of this country regard carefully what's happened here, because the problem that West Virginia is facing is the problem that all America is going to face. That is the problem of what happens to men when machines take their place. We produce more coal than we did 20 years ago in West Virginia, but there are thousands of men who mined in 1940 who can't find a job what is happening in the coal industry in the last 10 years in West Virginia is going to spread all over the country. When a machine takes the job of 10 men, where do those 10 men go? What happens to their families? They live in unemployment compensation and that runs out. They live on a subsistence diet distributed by the federal government which is beyond the living standard for any American. And then they wait for a chance and a job. I must say I am delighted I came here to West Virginia. I think everyone who seeks the office of the presidency should be willing to come. The lesson is hard, but it's important for all Americans. Thank you very much, Senator Kennedy. You have uh, been shy 10 seconds of your five minutes. We move on now to the rebuttal portion of the formal debate. 
Senator Humphrey, in the with, in accordance with the uh, pre the order established by the flipping of the coin, it is your turn now to rebut. You will have five minutes for this as well. And you may begin, sir. Thank you, Mr. Ames. <coughs> it would be, of course, uh, very undesirable and foolish to attempt to rebut a fine and splendid and pleasant statement as to the, the wonderful assets and the great qualities of the state of West Virginia and its people, the state that has this marvelous history of freedom and its great contribution to our American system. But I do think there are points that well ought to be emphasized that once having made the generalized statements, while it is true that automation and technological improvements have taken jobs, it is equally true that a government that is worthy of the respect of the American people will move into action with private industry and with labor and with the local communities to find new jobs, to retrain workers, to provide for new industries and to diversify the economy. It is equally true that a government has a responsibility, not the total responsibility, but a responsibility to the total economy of the nation. And when you break that down, you make it into the respective jurisdictions, such as our states. Now, West Virginia's problems, as I indicated in my opening statement, are characteristic of this country. In fact, I might say that I wish that the television camera that, is, that has become so much a part of the American scene would not only focus upon uh, certain areas of West Virginia uh, where there is unemployment and distress, but that it would find its way into parts of New York City and Philadelphia and Baltimore and Boston and, yes, Minneapolis and Chicago to look into those slums where people live in, uh, in metropolitan areas in conditions that are incredible. And yet we have a government that says we have prosperity. I must say, without arguing with my associate from Massachusetts, that we have been taught in recent days by our current government not to care. And I consider this to be immoral. It is absolutely necessary for us to care for one another. The strength of the American economy is best judged by the weakness of any section or any person or any part. And wherever there is an area of unemployment or distress or suffering, Wherever there is a slum, wherever there are conditions that degrade humankind, it weakens America. And it surely weakens our moral posture in the world. And it takes a terrible toll in terms of the economics of our country. You see, I was trying to emphasize in my opening statement that America needs to be strong. We're facing the toughest competition of our lives, tougher than anyone ever dreamed. In the Soviet Union, and Mr. Khrushchev, as he symbolizes it, is determined to surpass us. And he's fighting us, competing with us on every area, not merely military. He's competing with us economics and economics and education, science and technology and culture. And we have to be prepared to meet that competition and to surpass it, to expand the areas of freedom. Now, you can't do that if you ignore problems at home. For example, if we're going to have a foreign policy which is willing to loan economic assistance to every nation in the world under the International Development Loan Fund, which I have supported, it seems to me we must have a domestic policy which will make possible loans to local, to local communities, to local industries, to Americans for the improvement of economic conditions in our own country. In other words, our ability to maintain our strength abroad will be dependent in no small part upon our capacity to have full production and employment at home with social justice. Now, I have some programs that I've mentioned. I don't think the generalities are anywhere uh, accurate or adequate. I think I know what it means to be in trouble, to be poor, to be without a job. I learned something about that in the Depression of South Dakota. I've seen it in the iron mines of Minnesota. I didn't have to go to the coal mines of West Virginia for first-hand knowledge. I've seen it. I've tasted it. I don't like it. And therefore, I propose that we have area redevelopment, that we find new uses for coal and find new outlets for this great source of power, that we build generating plants at the mouth of the mine, for example, that we distribute electricity throughout this whole eastern seaboard, which is a great power center of America, the great industrial center, that we develop the great recreational facilities of West Virginia, that we make it the people's playground, that we give our young people a chance to work in the forests 
and out in the public lands and the parks in a youth conservation corps program, that we spend time and money upon conservation. All of this is an asset. All of this is an investment in the future. Those are my views for the future of this state. And now, Senator Kennedy, it is your turn to rebut statements made by Senator Humphrey. Our thanks to you, Senator Humphrey. Senator Humphrey's ambition to attain higher office soon resurfaced, accelerated by events. Relatively soon after JFK's assassination, Humphrey began an intensive effort to woo labor leaders I knew, journalists and commentators who wrote and rewrote the vice presidential story and leaders of the business community, an area where I was very weak. Despite strong support from party, civil rights, and labor leaders, he found himself competing for the nomination with his fellow senator from Minnesota, Eugene McCarthy. Characteristically, Johnson toyed with Humphrey, adding conditions for the nomination and refusing to make an ironclad commitment until well after the convention had started. Humphrey remembered campaigning hard, delighting in the first plane solely under his campaign's command, the redoubtable Happy Warrior. So just a little bit more that we kind of already, you know, discussed. Humphrey was born in a room over his father's drugstore in Wallace, South Dakota. He was the son of Ragnald Christine Sands, a Norwegian immigrant, and Hubert Horatio Humphrey Sr. Humphrey spent most of his youth in Dolan, South Dakota, on the Dakota Prairie. The town's population was about 600. His father was a licensed pharmacist and merchant who served as mayor and a town council member. Father also served briefly in the South Dakota State Legislature and was a South Dakota delegate to the 1944 and 1948 Democratic National Conventions. In the late 1920s, a severe economic downturn hit Dolan. Both banks in the town closed and Humphrey's father struggled to keep his store open. After his son graduated from Dolan's high school, Hubert Sr. left Dolan and opened a new drugstore in the larger town of Huron, South Dakota, population 11,000, where he hoped to improve his fortunes. Because of the family's financial struggles, Humphrey had to leave the University of Minnesota after just one year. He earned a pharmacist license from the Capital College of Pharmacy in Denver, Colorado, completing a two-year licensure program in just six months. And he helped his father run his store from 1931 to 1937. Both father and son were innovative in finding ways to attract customers. To supplement their business, the Humphreys had become manufacturers of patent medicines for both hogs and humans. A sign featuring a wooden pig was hung over the drugstore to tell the public public about this unusual service. Farmers got the message and it was Humphreys that became known as the Farmer's Drug Store. One biographer noted, while Hubert Jr. minded the store and stirred the concoctions in the basement, Hubert Sr. Hubert Sr. went on the road selling Humphreys BTV, Body Tone Veterinary, a mineral supplement and dewormer for hogs, and Humphrey's chest oil and Humphrey's sniffles for two-legged sufferers. Humphrey later wrote, we made Humphrey sniffles a substitute for Vic's nose drops. I felt ours was better, were better. Vic's used mineral oil, which is not absorbent, and we used a vegetable oil base, base which was. It goes on a little more to just explain about the uh, Humphrey Sniffles uh, concoction. Over time, Humphrey's Drugstore became a profitable enterprise and the family again prospered. While living in Huron, Humphrey regularly attended Huron's largest Methodist church and became scoutmaster of the church's Boy Scout Troop 6. He started basketball games in the church basement 
Although his scouts had no money for camp in 1931, Hubert found a way in the worst of that summer's dust storm grit, grasshoppers and depression to lead an overnight outing. Humphrey did not wor enjoy working as a pharmacist and his dream remained to earn a doctorate in political science and become a college professor. His unhappiness was manifested in stomach pains and fainting spells, though doctors could find nothing wrong with him. In August of 1937, he told his father that he wanted to return to the University of Minnesota. Hubert Sr. tried to convince his son not to leave by offering him a full partnership in the store. But Hubert Jr. refused and told his father how depressed I was, almost physically ill from the work, the dust storms, the conflict between my desire to do something and be somebody, and my loyalty to him. He replied, Hubert, if you weren't happy, then you ought to do something about it. Humphrey returned to the University of Minnesota in 1937 and earned a Bachelor of Arts in 1939. He was a member of Phi Delta Chi, a pharmacy fraternity. He also earned a master's degree from Louisiana State University in 1940, serving as an assistant instructor of political science there. One of his classmates was Russell B. Long, a future U.S. Senator from Louisiana. Then it says he became an instructor and doctoral student at the University of Minnesota. Uh, he was a supervisor for the Works Progress Administration. He was a star on the debate team. Uh, one of his teammates on the debate team was future Minnesota Governor and U.S. Secretary of Agriculture, Orville Freeman. In the 1940 presidential campaign, Humphrey and future University of Minnesota President Malcolm Moose debated the merits of Franklin D. Roosevelt, the Democratic nominee, and Wendell Wilkie, the Republican nominee, on a Minneapolis radio station. Humphrey supported Roosevelt. Humphrey soon became active in Minnesota politics, or Minneapolis politics, and as a result never finished his Ph.D., in 1934, Humphrey began dating Muriel Buck, a bookkeeper and graduate of local Huron College. They were married from 1936 until Humphrey's death nearly 42 years later. They had four children, Nancy Fay, Hubert Horatio III, Robert Andrew, and Douglas Sands. Money was an issue. One biographer noted, for much of his life, he was short of money to live on, and his relentless drive to attain the White House seemed at times like one long, losing struggle to raise enough campaign funds to get there. To help boost his salary, Humphrey frequently took paid outside speaking engagements. Through most of his years as a U.S. Senator and Vice President, he lived in a middle-class suburban housing development in Chevy Chase, Maryland. In 1958, the Humphreys used their savings and his speaking fees to build a lakefront home in Waverly, Minnesota, about 40 miles west of Minneapolis. Then it just talks about how he tried to join the armed services like three different times, but failed. His first two attempts, um, you know, he, he was rejected for color blindness and all sorts of medical ailments, hernia, um, all sorts of things. Uh, then how he was a college instructor. Um, he ran for elective office, the mayor of Minneapolis. We went over that. You know, all this stuff. And then it kind of leads into the 1948 Democratic National Convention and that famous speech that we discussed earlier. And then it really just goes into the, you know, his set time in the Senate. United States Senate from 1949 to, to 1964. Uh, he was a senator and in the Senate. Uh, we know that. Uh, and that pretty much leads us right up to his vice presidency. Uh, and then what we're going to do tomorrow in part two, we're going to talk about his vice presidency, his presidential uh, candidacy and uh, nomination and run uh, for the presidency. We're going to talk about that. We'll talk about his legacy, his time after politics, and then, of course, his 
you know, his death and his grave site and all that stuff that we always do here at Dead History. We'll talk about all that. Now, keep in mind, I know this part one was a little longer, but part two tomorrow will probably be pretty lengthy, probably over an hour long, because there's a lot to cover regarding his vice presidency and then his presidential run and all that stuff. So keep that in mind. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this. Now, listen, I don't have any bonus footage. The only bonus footage I have is for um, part two, my visit to his gravesite. I, of course, did visit his gravesite out there in Minnesota. I have uh, bonus footage for that in part two. But part one, no bonus footage. Any of the other photos that I've been showing, his childhood home or his house he lived in, any of that stuff, are all stock photos I found online. Those are not my photos. The only thing regarding Hubert Humphrey that I visited was his gravesite. So keep that in mind, please. Uh, thanks, guys. Thanks so much. 10,000 plus subscribers here on this channel. We can't believe it. We truly can't. Thank you so much for all the support. Thank you for all you guys do. Uh, sincerely, Henry and I cannot thank you guys enough. So... Stay tuned. Hope you enjoyed part one and stay tuned tomorrow for part two as we finalize and conclude our look at our 38th vice president of the United States, Hubert Horatio Humphrey. Thanks, guys. See you tomorrow.